All right, we are going to go through chapter five, Newton's Laws of Motion. Um, we're going to start with free body diagrams. Um, these are a skill. What you're trying to do when you draw a free body diagram is to um, figure out what all of the forces on an object are, um, because forces are what determine the acceleration. So you're going to look at a situation and consider all of the relevant forces. Now I said relevant, sometimes you're neglecting forces and sometimes, so when you're neglecting forces, you don't draw those. Um, and you're also going to look at what are the in, you know, what are these, you know, what is the system? You only care about forces on the system. Um, so if I have some particular object and I want to look at, at how it's moving, um, I only need to consider the forces on the object, not within the object. Okay, so here you have two ice skaters pushing on a, um, pushing on a third ice skater. Um, you, the reason why it matters that they're ice skaters is that there's an implicit assumption in the problem that we can approximate friction as zero and we only have to worry about the forces of the ice skater on the ice skaters on the other ice skaters, that we do not have to worry about the, um, the ice friction of the ice skater with the ground. Um, and what you're going to do, so each of them is pushing conveniently enough it makes a nice looking, um, I would want to draw um, my axes like this, X and Y. Um, and if I do that, then one of them is pushing entirely along the X direction, the other is pushing entirely on the Y direction. What we do with the free body diagram is that we then use the vector sum of all of those forces and calculate the total force on the object. So, um, oh, this is a lovely one. Um, you're going to have this one beaten into your head because this is a really important example. Um, so if you have a box acting on, a, a, a box sitting on a surface, um, you only have two forces, so you know in this case, a box sitting on the ground is not moving. So the net force must be zero because it's not accelerating. Um, so we know that there's gravity acting on everything. There is also uh, a force that counteracts a gravity so that the box doesn't fall through the floor because we know physically the box does not just go straight through the floor. Um, so we call that force the normal force because it is normal to the surface. Surfaces are going to push back um, perpendicular to the surface. Um, the, what the normal force actually is microscopically is that it's the atoms in the box pushing against the atoms in the floor because the, the atoms in the floor um, are not going to let that, don't want the atoms in the box to get too close. So it's actually from that box sitting on the floor um, and, and pushing against the atoms in the, the floor. Now, we have an incline plane. You are going to, um, you're going to do a lot of problems with this. The normal to the surface, incline plane just means it's not flat. The normal to the surface is perpendicular to the surface. So in that case, the normal to the surface is right here but gravity is always pointing down. Now, this also has a friction force drawn on it. You will do problems both where you have friction and where you do not have friction. So when you have friction acting on it, you would draw fr friction is always opposite to the direction of motion. So if your box is sliding down the incline plane, friction acts up, it's trying to slow it down. Um, if your box is sliding up the incline plane, Friction is pointing down. Um, so things to note, normal force, always perpendicular to the surface. Weight, always pointing down or towards the center of the earth. Friction, always pointing opposite to the direction of motion. And that can mean that if you have the box going up the plane and the box going down the plane, 
with friction, those are no longer symmetric. Okay, springs, I love springs. Um, so one time I was teaching and I just was so excited and I said, life is just a mass on a spring. And then one of my students chimed in and then you derive, it's a great joke. Um, I love when my students get me. Okay, so a spring has a certain length and when you stretch it, the spring wants to go it wants to go back to where it was. It wants to have its regular length. So you experience a restoring force that brings it, that, tries, that counteracts the stretch. A spring actually also acts the opposite way. If you compress it, the restoring force is trying to stretch the spring out. The spring always wants to go in the direction to restore, um, to restore its length. So we quantify that. We say that the force is negative kx, where k is a spring constant. Um, it's a constant that is a feature of the spring. Um, and so you can have stiffer springs where that spring constant is larger and, um, and looser springs where that spring constant is smaller. Um, you're always assuming that, the, that there's some length. Now, a problem I have with this particular notation is it's assuming that your origin, and if I draw, um, it's putting the origin right there when the spring is not compressed. So I actually like to write this as negative k x minus x naught. Um, it, the version that doesn't have that difference is okay, as long as you remember that the restoring force is always relative to the equilibrium position of the spring. Um, a common example is a spring scale. So you're going to see several examples we have with spring scales in class. Um, but I would, um, but the reason this is important, so I still remember when I was in intro physics and I'm going, that's lovely, but like there's, n we only can solve a handful of cases. Like, why do I care about masses on springs? Because I never see masses on springs. Like it's the only reason we're doing this because we can solve it. The reason is because almost everything can be approximated as a mass on a spring. Anytime you have some system which is approximately at equilibrium, you can always approximate it as a mass on a spring and at least get most of the behavior and much of physics and much of contemporary physics still involves, you start with an approximation that something is a mass on a spring and then you add corrections to that. And to get to higher and higher precision, you get to higher and higher, uh, you get higher and higher order precision corrections but you're often starting with the basic assumption that yeah everything's a mass on a spring if it's if it's a bound system it's a mass on a spring um, and this works this works even you know even down to nuclei you essentially have a quantum mechanical version of a mass on a spring and it works really really well so um, that's springs they are more useful than they look at first but do watch the origin. Try to remember that the origin is at the equilibrium position. Okay, you can have a lot of different um, situations. So here is a person sitting on a chair. Um, this person is not me because office chairs are designed for the average man. My feet hang off the office chair. Anyhow. So you don't have to worry about the floor pushing up on me. Um, you always have to make some assumptions. So in practice, you see this man's feet sitting on the floor. Some of his weight is on the floor. Uh, most of his weight is on the chair. So we're gonna make an, and some of it's on the table because he's leaning on the table a little bit. We're gonna make an approximation that all of his weight is on the chair. Um, and then you have two forces, his weight and the uh, force of the normal force of the chair on the man. Um, 
if you had to consider the force of the table on the man or the force of the floor on the man, then it becomes a much more complicated problem. What I wanna point out here is that when you're doing these problems, you want to elucidate very clearly what assumptions you are making in your problem. That's a very important part of solving a physics problem. What assumptions are you making? Make sure that you understand those assumptions as well. Um, here you have a hockey puck, you're hitting a hockey puck. Um, and what you're, and initially it's at rest. Um, and I think the next slide, yeah, the next slide's showing the, the, um, the free body diagram. Um, initially it's at rest, then you hit it and it remains in motion. Now, when you hit it, what's going on is a little bit complicated because there actually is a force on the puck. But before you hit it and after you hit it, the force, the free body diagram is the same. Um, we are using, um, uh, this is in, now this is a uh, air hockey table is different from, uh, from hockey, but either way, what you're doing is that you're neglecting the forces of friction between the, between the surface and the, um, and the puck. So in that case, you have two forces. You have a normal force um, or a force from, uh, for, the air for an air hockey table, some upward force from the air and then a downward weight. And because the puck is not moving up or down, the net force in the y direction has to be zero. Um, so these are your two forces. Um, and then we use, how do we use this? We use Newton's second law, F equals MA. So once we have the forces, we can calculate the acceleration. And then when we have the acceleration, we can calculate something's trajectory, which is the entire point of this unit. Okay, now I have a car um, initially parked and then it moves. So what can we say about the car? Um, if it's moving at constant velocity, it is not accelerating. If it is not accelerating, the net force on the car is zero. Um, and, and we can tell that because of Newton's second law. Um, if the acceleration is zero, the net force is zero. Okay, so when you have, so you're pushing a car, if you are pushing a car, you've got here, you, this is a very complicated situation. You've got two people pushing the car. There's a normal force on, of the road onto the car, and then there's the weight of the car, there's some friction. In practice, this friction is gonna be some internal resistance in the wheels. Two people are pushing, um, so the net force in the y direction is zero. The net force in the x direction, you hope, is going to be um, in the positive x direction that you're overcoming friction and the two people can, can push the car. So you, to get the net force, you're actually going to do vector addition. Now you remember with vectors, you can rearrange everything and you can, so you can just move the arrows around. Um, so then you do the vector sum in the y direction, it's got to be zero. So that's how you know what the normal force is. Um, friction turns out to actually be proportional to the normal force. Um, so you need to know the value of the normal force. And then you have the, the net force on the, um, on these two, from these two men pushing the car. Um, the net force is gonna be the two men pushing the car minus friction. You can also have a tow truck and then you have the, where the, where the forces are applied is slightly different. That can matter. And we're gonna to get to rotations where we consider where, where, the, where the forces matter. Um, that becomes more important when we have rotation, but for now we're just gonna sort of fudge it because we're only gonna cover problems where it doesn't matter. Um, you still have friction um, and you still have the normal force and the weight. Um, now, the free body diagrams, if you have someone pushing a ball versus someone pushing a car, the free body diagrams are the same in this case. Um, and 
So here you're told in the problem to ignore the effect of gravity on the ball. Now in practice, that's probably not negligible if you're looking at say the trajectory of the ball, but if you're looking at a collision, it might not be. It might be an okay assumption because gravity doesn't act that quickly. Um, and then in the case of pushing a car, um, the normal force and the weight counteract each other. So if you have the same force, you I prefer if you draw the normal force and the uh, the weight as well. So I actually would. Ah, it's good to just draw all the forces, even if you don't need them, and then explicitly state what your assumptions are. Get in the habit of stating what your assumptions are, um, and then your net force is going to be the same. Now, F equals m a. So if you have a larger mass, in the case of the car versus the ball, your forces, this, your forces are the same, your acceleration is going to be larger for the ball. Now, intuitively, you know this. It's easier to push a ball than a car. Um, and Newton's second law is how you quantify that. Okay, so um, you have, if you have some, uh, this, you can't do the, this problem mathematically because this doesn't have the mass of the lawnmower, but you have some net force on the lawnmower. Um, that net force is gonna be the man pushing minus the internal resistance of the engine, slowing it down. Um, so, how fast do you accelerate? You would just have an acceleration of F net over M. So that's gonna give your acceleration. There will be a free body diagram on the test, probably most tests this semester. Okay, car moving at constant speed versus car accelerating. Um, and if you are moving, so if you are moving at constant speed, your net force has to be zero. If you are accelerating, then your net force has to be positive. So um, if friction is the same in both cases, you know that the force of the engine has to be larger in the second case. And you guys actually, you, you can confirm this experimentally because I'm, I'm gonna assume that most of you drive you haven't driven, you've probably ridden a bike. If you want to speed up, that is accelerate, um, you have to push your, put your foot on the gas or pedal harder. Um, so you know that if you want to accelerate, this force of the engine or your pedal power needs to be greater. Okay, here's another example. There is a sled that has rockets. Uh, that sounds sort of dangerous to me. Um, four rockets, each of which produce an identical thrust, a T, so that's the force produced by the rocket. There's a normal force, there's a weight, there's a friction. To consider, so the net force is going to be, well, you can draw and your free body diagram, you can draw all of the forces from the origin, but when you're calculating the net force, you're gonna to wanna to do the vector addition of all of these. So your net force is gonna be something like this in this case. All right, so now you have four forces in the XY plane. So how do you add these? I'm gonna go through some of the mass, some of the math. So here, F1 is going to be the magnitude of F1, cosine 30 degrees, x hat, plus the magnitude of F1, sine 30 degrees, y hat, F2 is negative, the magnitude of F2, y hat, F3, is equal to negative F3 X hat and F4 is equal to F3 
for y hat. So when you add these all together, you're going to add up all the x components and all the y components. So this is going to give you a net force of f1 cosine theta minus f3 x hat and then plus f1 sine theta uh, um, minus f2 plus f4 y hat. Notice that I'm treating these unit vectors basically like algebraic variables. I just can't reduce them, but I, I, I can't cross them out, but um, I'm treating it exactly like I was. I'm, there's a variable and I'm combi combining all of the different terms. So this is how you would get the net force after you've gotten your force diagram, your, your free body diagram. All right, this one we can do as well. Always draw your coordinate system before you do anything. So this suggests a coordinate system like this. Although I could be, um, I could be, I, I could resist the temptation to draw the system the coordinate system they want, and I could put this as my x-axis if I wanted to. The problem doesn't specify. You're allowed to choose whatever coordinate system you want. Um, okay, so now if I choose this coordinate system, I am going to add, I'm going to call this force one and this force two so that I can have some notation that makes it easy to tell what I'm doing mathematically. Force one is going to be 450 Newtons cosine 30 degrees x hat and then plus ah i have done this wrong this is a great example because i i have to look at where that angle is so if you look at this angle instead of being relative to the x-axis it's to the y-axis so i actually have 450 sine 30 degrees x hat plus 450 cosine 30 degrees y hat f2 is i have something similar um, negative 380 sine 10 degrees x hat. Note the negative sign. So if I'm just after the magnitude of the component in x, the magnitude is 380 sine 10 degrees. But because um, of the orientation of this angle to get the size of the x component, I have to put a negative sign out there as well. This is where you can't just blindly memorize some equation and apply it. You have to look at the actual situation every single time. So plus 380. Now this is cosine 10 degrees y hat. So my net force is 450 sine 30 degrees minus 380 sine 10 degrees x hat. Oh, another common mistake that students make. It's really dumb. We all make dumb mistakes. Watch whether your calculator is in radians or degrees. Um, I do have to mark points off if you do the wrong thing. If you've set it up correctly, I will give you most of the credit um, if I can tell what you did. Another common problem is that students focus so much on getting the right answer that they don't try to lay out their answer in a coherent way. 
if you've made a dumb mistake, if you've just, if you've set it up correctly and the numbers disagree, I'm going to look at that and go, eh, okay, some dumb calculator problem. Plug, problem was pr plugging the numbers into the calculator, but they got the big picture concept, most of the credit. If you write your answer as an incoherent mess, and I can't tell what you did, and all I can tell is that you got the wrong answer, you don't get credit. Um, and this is where some of the other classes where you might have been using an awful lot of online homework, online homework only cares about the right answer. So you can have the thinking right and get the answer wrong, you don't get credit, or the thinking wrong and get the answer right, and you do get credit. You have to convey to me what your reasoning is. Um, and that means you have to start working on a logical answer. If you get the right answer, but I can't tell what you did, you might get zero credit. Okay. Um, here's another example. You don't know the magnitude of that force, but you know the acceleration. So here, I am going to choose a coordinate system. Notice that I am always picking a coordinate system and I like to draw it explicitly on the on my picture of the problem. Every, almost every physics problem starts with drawing a picture. All right, so now I have F is going to be equal to positive magnitude of F y hat. Weight is equal to negative 180 y hat. And, ooh, I know, ah, this is a good one because weight is also equal to m, uh, mg. So I actually can get that the mass is equal to, uh, uh, this I'm sorry, negative mg because of the negative sign. My mass is equal to 180 over 9.8. Um, so I know the mass. Um, I could also write that as weight over g. Um, and now I know f net is equal to m a which is equal to this force f minus weight so that's i'm gonna it's all in the y direction so i'm gonna drop the vector signs and only work with the magnitudes so m a W over G A, and that is equal to the magnitude of F minus the magnitude of the weight. So the magnitude of the force is going to be equal to weight, the, the weight times one plus A over G. And then I can get that magnitude of that force. So what I do is that I start with drawing the free body diagram. I draw a coordinate system. I write down each of my vectors in terms of their coordinates in my coordinate system. I solve for the net force. When I've solved for the net force, well, at that point, I want to look for what exactly am I, am I trying to find. In this case, I was after the magnitude of force F. Um, sometimes when I'm doing problems like this, when I start to set things up, I like to circle whatever it is that I'm finding. Um, I might want to underline any unknowns. Um, develop a system. And when you have a methodical system, for solving problems, even when they're simple. When you get to the much more complicated problems where you maybe don't, this one, you might've seen how to solve it before you wrote any numbers down, but there's gonna be ones where you don't. So if you develop your system on the simple problems, when you get to the harder problems, it's gonna be a lot easier. All right, so here, 
um, you have, um, so every force exerts an equal and opposite force. So when you, um, when you are swimming, so the, these different forces on the free body diagram, the weight of the swimmer, the buoyant force of, on, of the water on the swimmer. Buoyant force is the, the water pushing you up because you are lighter than water. Um, so the, the net motion of the swimmer in the, um, in the y direction is zero. So the buoyant force must directly um, cancel the must exactly cancel the weight. And then when the swimmer pushes on the wall, the wall pushes on the swimmer with the exact same force. So the way that you push off from the wall when you're swimming is the way that you move is to push off from the wall and that's giving you um, exactly the, that's gonna push you away from the wall as well. Okay. Here's a more complicated situation with force diagrams. You have a mass on a scale. There is a weight acting on the scale. Um, and that means, or so, there's a weight acting on, on the package. That means the package is pushing down on the scale. Because the package is pushing down on the scale, the scale pushes up on the package with the exact same force. Um, that is through Newton's third law. And then the scale um, is going to push down on the earth. And then the earth pushes back on the scale. Okay, so you have these pairs of forces. So you can consider um, that every single, um, you can consider every single part of the system to have its own free body diagram. So you have a free body diagram for the package on the scale and a free body diagram for the, you, and a free body diagram for the scale on the earth. And it effectively, the scale's just sitting between the earth and you can simplify it. And here are the action and reaction pairs. So the scale pushes on, the, the package pushes on the, the scale, so the scale pushes on the package. The, um, you can think of it as well as the earth, um, the package pushes on the earth, so the earth pushes on the package. Okay, so here you have someone pushing a cart um, and there's friction, there's the, so you have system one is the professor and the cart um, and then her foot is pushing on the floor, so the floor is pushing on her foot. And that is how the system is moving forwards. And then friction is slowing her down. Um, you can also consider the cart without the professor. And then you consider the force of the professor on the cart, friction, the weight of the cart, and then normal to the cart. So figuring out your system is very important because that tells you which forces you can neglect. So when you're considering the professor and the cart, you don't worry about the force of the professor on the cart and the cart force of the cart on the professor because that is an internal force. It is a force only to, between things that are, in, as, that are part of the same system. All right, and moving on to the example that we have tortured students with over centuries, the inclined plane. This is a really important. Um, this is a really important problem um, because it exhibits the way you should think about physics problems, and that's why um, we make you do it. There will be an inclined plane problem on the exam. Um, 
So you start with your free body diagram. Weight is always acting towards the center of the earth. The normal force is always perpendicular to the surface. So in this case, the normal force and the weight are not the same. Friction acts against motion. So in this case, the skier is going downhill. So friction is acting uphill. Now, what do you do after you draw a free body diagram? You draw a coordinate system. So we are going to draw up. We are going to draw our coordinate system here, x, y. This is the trick with the inclined plane. Your coordinate system is not parallel to the Earth. Your coordinate system is parallel to the plane. So when you do this, you can write each of the forces. Now, here, your force, your, the total weight makes an angle of 25 degrees. You know it's 25 degrees because it's 25 degrees at the bottom. So by doing some geometry, you can figure out that the weight makes an angle of 25 degrees with your new special y-axis. So then you can write that the weight, again, watch sines versus cosines. So this is going to be, I drew positive x going up the slope. So, so now the weight is in the negative x direction. Negative weight, mag magnitude of weight. And now this is a sine theta. And the theta is 25 degrees, sine theta. And then it is a, it, we, we also have a negative weight now cosine theta y hat. So that's your weight. Your net motion in the x direction has to be zero. So that's going to tell you your normal force because the only other force that you have in the y direction is the normal force. So your normal force then uh, has to equal positive weight cosine theta. Now, the coefficient of kinetic friction, the, the magnitude of, of, sorry, the magnitude of kinetic friction, which means when you're moving, is proportional with mu k, some constant for two different surfaces, to the, um, it's proportional to the normal force. How hard are you pushing down? So now I can tell you that the friction force is in the positive x direction, and it's going to have magnitude mu k omega cosine, or sorry, mu k w cosine theta. Um, so then I add my friction force. Sorry, this is not an organized. This is the, an example of a not organized problem set up because I'm dry, writing it on the slide and the slide is not very, um, it is, does not give me a lot of room to work with. So my net force, oh, and I have dropped my X hat. Um, my net force is going to be mu, so F net, is equal to mu k weight cosine theta minus weight sine theta x hat. There it is. That is the inclined plane problem. Um, you will be tested on it. You will be. You will have homework problems on it. That's the problem. So sear it into your head. Um, here's breaking that angle, how you break that weight into each of the different components. So you have similar triangles here and here, which is how you know the angle here. All right, so sear this problem into your head. It will show up. The variations are whether 
something is going up the plane or down the plane, I can have you have push a box up a hit, an inclined plane and then it falls back down. If you include friction on that, the friction is going, is friction always opposes the direction of motion. So it's going to, friction's sign is going to change in each direction. If you neglect friction, then, um, then you end up with a symmetric problem that actually you, you have the same force in both directions. Life is easy. Um, there's a bunch of variations on that problem that I can give, but it is a very important problem um, in, in intro physics and mechanics. You're, you're going to see it again. So practice it, know it inside out. Strings and tension when you're drawing these free body diagrams. So perfectly flexible connector. Uh, we'll, we'll have a lot of things we approximate as string. Um, it's transmitting a force, but it doesn't change the force. So you have a bunch of chains of equal and opposite forces. Um, so the net effect is that you're actually, if you're holding a mass on a string, you're of course exerting the force on the, the string itself and not on the mass, but that, um, that string then exerts a force on the mass. Um, so strings are just going to redirect the force. Okay, examples where you can just consider something redirection, some tension where it's redirecting forces are both tendons in a, in a muscle and, um, and all of the different parts of a bike where the, um, the different rods on the bike, the parts of the bike frame are exerting some tension. So the direction is changed, but the, the magnitude is not. Okay, so here is an example. So tension is always parallel to the string. So if you have a tightrope walker, um, there is tension from each side. You can model the string as two, this one string is two different strings. There's a tension and the string along that direction and a tension and the string along that direction, and then the weight. So you can actually, use this to calculate if there's a sag of five degrees you can calculate what the tension is um, if you know the weight of the person so tension is redirecting and tension is always parallel to the the string here you can see that broken up in greater d detail so the two things counteracting the weight of the tightrope walker or the tension, the vertical components of the tension in each half of the string. Um, there's no net X force. Um, and the end result is that the total tent, because the angle is so small, the total tension is much greater than the weight. Similarly, you can have a car pulling on, um, on some object with a tow chain and just by pushing slightly perpendicular, you're dramatically increasing the, um, the tension in the string, which means, which if you don't want your bumper to fall off your car, you shouldn't do that. You probably shouldn't do this with your car anyways. Okay, so here you have a variation on a block, on, on a mass on, a, on an inclined plane. You have a, um, to one mass on top of another um, where you are pulling the upper mass with a string. Um, this looks like a really gnarly problem. So you have, uh, if you draw your free body diagram, you have the tension in the string, the weight of mass A, and then the normal force of A on, of B on A, and then you have some friction because uh, this is either kinetic or static. If the system is moving, it's kinetic. If the, if the block A is not moving relative to B, it's static. Um, then on block B, you have both friction from A on B 
and friction from B on the plane. Um, and this is assuming that B is sliding down and A is sliding up. But if you had, well, it would depend on which block, which directions the blocks are moving. So this is where you have to be slow and meticulous. You have the weight of mass B. You have the normal force of A on B because the fact that B is producing a, is producing a normal force on A means that A produces a normal force on B. So you have two forces in the negative Y direction. And then you have the normal force of the incline plane on mass B. And the net force in the Y direction has to be zero. So here you have a coupled system and the math gets more complicated, but the principle is the same. All right, here, and I think, yeah, this is, here you have coupled masses connected by a pulley. A pulley also only redirects the, the force. It does not change the magnitude of the force. So here you have a mass that only has two forces. It's gonna have weight and it's gonna have the tension and the strain. This one has tension in the strain, presumably some friction. Um, you could have some friction in the pulley, but for now we're gonna go with frictionless pulleys. Um, so there's some friction in the, slowing this block down. There's, there's weight and then there's the normal force. So we can draw off, ah, this doesn't, this was neglecting friction. If you wanna, this has the free body diagrams for each of those blocks. If you wanna include friction, ah, if you wanna include friction, it's gonna counteract motion. Well, I didn't say which way it's moving. So it could, um, it could be moving in either direction. See, did we have, oh, we had, oh, sorry. It isn't moving. It's only gonna be able to fall down the hill. So down the, down the ramp. So it's, it, friction would act in this direction. Okay. So that's one more example. Here you have coupled carts connected through a string over a pulley. You're gonna have gravity. Your gravity is gonna act always straight down on both mass one and mass two. It looks like these two different um, inclined planes are at different angles as well, and the masses are different. In both cases, you have gravity, you may have friction, you have a normal force, and you have the tension in the string. Uh, so uh, if I try to draw those, here I've got, ah, Here, I've got gravity, I've got my weight. Um, I have a normal force. I have tension in the string. I'm gonna do a subscript two. Um, the tension in the string has to be the same because the tension, the string and the pulley are only, ah, so I actually can delete the subscript. No, I wanna keep the subscript because I want to, I wanna make sure that I have it down that I can use, I can have different directions. Because the tension in the string here is going to act up. I've got a normal force. I've got a weight. And then I'm gonna consider two situations. Let's say mass two is falling down, which means that mass one is moving up. In that case, my friction is acting in this direction um, here, and it's acting in this direction here, because the friction is always going to counteract the direction of motion. And then I can consider the other, another case. Let's say mass one is going down, which means that mass two is going up. In that case, my friction is going to act in the opposite direction. So 
So depending on the relative masses and their angles, you actually could have the friction acting in different directions if you had to consider friction. So an important question, and if it's not clear in a problem, especially on ex an exam, ask what direction, you know, can I neglect friction? Often in this class, you can neglect friction. So if you aren't sure, ask. Okay, here's another example. You have a force that is acting on a mass. You're not pushing it directly across the floor, um, but you are pushing it, um, you're pushing it at an angle. Now, you also have the force of gravity on the mass. Let's see, and this, I can't tell if you're acting, this, I think you're acting in two. Um, so you're only acting in one direction. So you have gravity, you have a normal force. Now, when you have a force that has some component in the, some component down, you're actually gonna have a larger normal force than you would have without it because the box does not go through the, the floor. That's gonna increase your friction as well. Okay, springs. I did say a little bit about springs already. Um, if you haven't caught on, I absolutely adore springs. Springs are wonderful and more important than, it's, it's easy when you're in intro physics to miss how important springs are. Okay, the spring exerts a force proportional to its displacement from its equilibrium position. So if the spring is relaxed, there's no force. If the spring is compressed, the force pushes in one direction, and if the spring is stretched, it pushes in the other. And here, I like this formulation better because it's a delta x. Um, how far are you from equilibrium? And if you write it as the difference between your position and equilibrium, you will get the sign correct. All right, and with that, we end chapter five.